Well, good morning, everyone. I think it's time we, uh, we made a start. Uh, my name is, uh, is Peter Bruce. And uh, on behalf of uh, myself and my co-organizers of this meeting, uh, David Lane from Harriet Watt, Paul Newman from Oxford, and Ralph Speth, the CEO of Jaguar Land Rover, I'd like to bid you a very warm welcome to the Royal Society and to this meeting on robotics and autonomous systems. Now, before I say just a few words to uh, set the scene for the meeting and hopefully stimulate your thinking and discussion, we have some housekeeping matters to take care of first. Most important, the lavatories are one floor down in the basement. There is a lift, uh, but there's also a disabled toilet on this, on this floor. Now, normally at this point, I would ask you to switch off your mobile phones, but for reasons uh, you may know or I'll explain in a moment, I'll ask you not to switch them off, but to make sure they're on silent. Now, um, there won't be a fire drill. It's already happened this morning. So if the fire alarm does sound, it's the real thing. And there are exits uh, both to my left and right and at the, ba the, 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 the back of the lecture theater. Now, we are going to record this meeting. Uh, so you'll see some cameramen wandering around. Uh, if you feel uncomfortable about being recorded, please uh, make yourself known to some of the Royal Society staff and we'll endeavor to uh, respect your wishes. So why has the Royal Society decided to hold a meeting on robotics and autonomous systems? Well, the Royal Society is, is deeply committed to the science industry interface. And in response to that, it set up a committee, Science Industry and Translation Committee, uh, to uh, do all it can to promote and strengthen uh, that interface. And we looked at a number of, of, of key sectors and identified robotics and autonomous systems, RAS, as one of the most important sectors for growth that really requires that combination of fundamental breakthroughs in science at the so-called low TRL levels, real transformational science, and the pull-through of that science into industry. And so it, it fits perfectly within the science industry uh, agenda. As I'm sure many of you know, RAS is going to be extremely important in virtually all sectors of human endeavor over the next 10 to 20 years. It's going to impact on virtually every area of society, uh, domestically, industrially, in transport and medicine. And we've endeavored to reflect the breadth of that impact in some of the talks that you'll hear uh, today. It's been um, proposed by McKinsey's that by 2025, the RAS sector could be worth somewhere between 1.9 and 6.4 trillion dollars, trillion dollars internationally. So it's going to grow to a massive area with huge impact. It's within the UK sector, it's, it's been identified as one of the uh, eight great technologies and we have a strategy driven largely by, by one of the co-organizers, David Lane, which is setting the UK in a very strong position in this area, but we really need to think about how we can build on that. So the things I would like you to consider and to bring up in the discussion and respond to the speakers are, where will the major breakthroughs be in RAS over the next 10 to 20 years? Where are the hurdles, where are the barriers to progress in this area? Where do we need transformational science? How do we strengthen the industrial base? How do we strengthen the science base in this area? And how do we link these two together to have more effective translation from science uh, into industry. I'd also like you to think about the skills agenda because in this sector, as in many others, we are really facing potentially a crisis in a shortage of skills. It's difficult to get people to study the science and engineering subjects, and there's a danger that we will not have that feedstock of intellectual talent to be the drivers for these innovations uh, over the next uh, couple of decades. So that's an important area. We need to think about how we can address that skills and training problem. At this point, I would also just like to thank my co-organizers. I've mentioned them, Ralph Speth, David Lane, and Paul Newman. Uh, they're the real experts. They're the ones who have done all the work in putting this program together. Uh, this is not particularly my field, so I'm deeply indebted to them for all, the, all they've done to, to bring this together today. And the success of the meeting is undoubtedly down to them. I want to thank the Royal Society staff for all their efforts, and I'll say more at the end of the meeting in my, in my summing up. Finally, back to the point about the mobile telephones. So we're going to have an experiment, at least I think it's the first time Royal Society has done this. Yes, Polly's nodding. Um, we're, we're going to use a thing called social Q&A, which means that you can submit your questions 
as you listen to the speaker using your tablet or laptop or mobile phone. Hence the request not to switch them off, just to make sure they're on the silent. So you can submit your questions. Um, they will be moderated, so uh, don't be tempted to say anything offensive because it won't get through, I, I assure you. And the idea is that the more popular, most popular questions will rise to the top and we'll be able to prioritize those so we can address those um, to, the, to the speakers. Uh, be assured, if you prefer to use the traditional method of raising your hand during the Q&A session, that will still work perfectly well. We'll have a normal process there too. Um, but uh, this is an experiment, so we hope it works well. You'll have to bear with us a little bit, especially, I guess, the first couple of talks. But I think it's very appropriate for a forward-looking subject like RAS that we should try to use a, 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 a relatively new technology. So with that, um, I think it's time to move on to the real business. And it's a great pleasure for me to introduce to you today our first speaker, Bernard Charles, uh, CEO of Dassault System. I won't read out um, the long bio he has of all his wonderful achievements. I'm sure he's known to a number of you already, but I'll just give you a little flavor of this. Uh, Bernard has been working as the CEO of Dassault Systems uh, since um, 1995. He started with the company in 1983, developing new design technologies. He founded the New Technologies Research and Strategy Development Department in 1988 and was appointed President of Strategy and Research and Development. Uh, he's a, a figure with great, I think, intellectual thought in this area, um, a driver for change, and it's a real delight to be able to welcome into the stage now, Bernard. Thank you very much. Good morning, uh, and thank you, Ralph, for inviting me uh, to this, uh, in front of this prestigious audience. Um, the topic uh, today is, is really something very close to our heart. And why so? Uh, because at Dassault System for the last 30 years, we have been developing with clients so many things to really transform the world industry in the way product works, but also in the way they are made. One could think that uh, an autofly airplane is a robot. So that's what we've been doing with those aerospace companies for so many years. As far as I know, most of the airplanes on the planet are now designed on system validated with Dassault system solutions. When I say most, it's just an elegant expression. Uh, all of them. Uh, so the second remark I would like to do is that we are also working with prestigious companies in their production systems. Of course, Jaguar Land Rover with great, great vision from Ralph on amazing, amazing transformation of the company as could be proven by the results of the company and on, on, on the incredible revolution there. Also with prestigious companies like Toyota, where all the digital definition on run of production systems, whereby it's the association, the core robotic of robots and human in a consistent, harmonized environment. So that's the background. The facets you might not know about Dassault System, and I want to touch base a little bit with you, are in three other directions. System biology, uh, where we believe multi-scale multi system is going to transform so many things in that world. And the system approach, we believe, is becoming common across all those sectors. We have yet to learn a lot from the observation of biology. And we believe that inspiration for the future of robotics will not come from the mechanical and electrical world or software world, but will come from bio-observation. That's why we invested 1.5 billion in the last three years to buy Acceleris, create Biovia, and I will talk to you about system biology from that sector. That's one direction. 
I said two additional directions. The second one is related to uh, the dimension of what we call social innovation. If I create my autonomous great system in my home, I can today, at this point in time, control my home from a phone. I think I am doing quite sophisticated system, but as a consumer. On that social dimension of fab labs in the world, on the impact of making it possible to connect software, hardware, on electronics in a way where young kids of the age of 12 to 15 can do a drone that only a few of the Thales Lockheed Martin or BAE system could do just a few years ago for a billion dollar investment are now possible for kids, which is what I call the amazing wave of innovation coming from the young generation. I believe in the young generation. As a wife, I would be fired with my wife because we have five children. So <laughs> I, better, I better have to take care. Uh, so that's why you have here the product side, the ergo side, what human beings are doing, the bio side, and of course the life science side, connecting together to learn. I like to summarize that a system with this picture because it does represent very well what we've been doing for the last 30 years and why I think it can be a significant contributor to the future. I've talked to you about airplanes already. Many people still think that what we do for this industry is just fitting parts together. We do much more than that. We can predict the entire system behavior and certify it with the software. When I say certification, it's not testing. It's the proof that it works, which is very different. You have the LVMH Foundation here with this amazing, sophisticated art, science, and technology coming together. This is what I call art, science, and technology coming together. There is more still there than in the Eiffel Tower. And the construction of that, one of a kind, was a system problem not a design problem only. It was about sequencing of things, about connecting all the environment together. In June uh, of this year, the Prime Minister of, and that's the third picture, of Singapore announced that they will use the 3D experience platform of Dassault system to do the virtual twin of the city. Is this to replace Google Maps or Google Street? Of course not. This is not the topic. It's to create the digital model of the city whereby all autonomous systems will be able to have a reference in which a system, multi-scale system approach can be done. This is what we are going to do today. And we are doing that and putting that in action because they want to evaluate how an aging person that needs some medical surveillance at any point in time in the city, how far that person is from any needed for rescue or support, if that's what's required. So this connection between smart system is important. The fourth image here is about autonomous car. We made a bet with a friend a few years ago when we had the crisis, 2008, with this uh, engineering service firm, not doing cars, that because the people were available, not having enough contracts going on with the crisis, we decided to build our own autonomous car, and we did it, and it works. So we demonstrated that with less than 100 people, we could create an entire automated system. Yes, it's more Fab Labs type. I think Ralph will not certify that car. <laughs> no doubts about it. We'll not probably produce the car either on we could debate about the styling of the car, by the way. But we wanted to demonstrate that there was a new level of affordability for system approach. And that's what it, it is here. <laughs> On the last pictures, I, lo I love the, 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 the three pictures in the middle. Those, I'm sure you, you, you recognize them. 
Amano San from uh, Nagoya University, uh, Nobel Prize, Martin Kaplus Nobel Prize. Uh, they, all of three of them are Nobel Prize. So why do I want to mention that? That because all of them have something in common. They have, they have used a system approach on the modeling and simulation to support their work. And that's also part, I believe, of, and, and by the way, it happened that is the so system platform, so please notice that. Uh, that is what we believe is the future of what we call collaborative system multi-scale approach. And last but not least, we did some research in the human modeling on uh, organs, cells, human cells, and I'll show you a few illustrations in a minute. And uh, of course, also about the system approach to heart surgery. Truly a system approach. And what we learned is that it was providing a, a second to none way for people from multidiscipline, electrical, bio tissue, earth, heart specialist, to work and understand each other. So one of the takeaway I would like to share with you today is one of the challenge in science and technology is to reduce the volume of communication and increase the volume of understanding. People over communicate and under understand each other. So how can we increase the level of understanding and reduce the volume of what is communicated because for human being there is a certain bandwidth and the reality of this bandwidth, it's a problem. Or it can be the solution as long as we understand each other. So that's why I believe that multi-scale, multi-physic, collaborative platform are going to change the way people can discover, invent, and realize, and compare the power of the virtual world where you can do impossible things with the real world which basically gives you the realism of it. So that's what I wanted to say. The second message I want to say is the good news about Raz is that there is a business dimension to it. It's not a science and technology dimension only. It is a business dimension. And that's the good news. That's why we talk about robotics for the last 40 years. And so many people have invested there. On so much has been done, but I could say also so little has been done in some way. But now the good news is the business is providing an horizon for it. And what is this? It's what I call the experience economy. We are not in a product economy anymore. We are in an economy of usage. We are in an economy of experience. The value is not anymore in the product. The value is in the experience that product or technology provides. And that's an amazing news. Why so? Because it creates a business perspective which is not only speed and performance to RAS, but is the business value to the society. Which experience do I provide? Under which condition? That's, I think, the motivation we have seen with autonomous cars. It's just not about more power or performances. It's about new type of services you can provide. So this encapsulation, this way of looking at it from the citizen or the consumer is transforming the way industry and even research is working and creating a new driver from that standpoint. So the social dimension is in Fab Labs, whether it is with citizen, whether it is with young generation doing amazing mechatronic systems is opening the eyes of capex, opex, intensive companies saying the game is changing. And the game is changing, why? Because now with digital modeling and simulation, we can envision to do things in a different way. So that's what I wanted to share with you. And that's why in our passion to provide science through software, because something which is not known, that the system is a quite secret company. Why so? Because for the first, first 20 years, we have worked for defense sensitive projects around the globe. 
Everything that is under the water, underwater, in the sky, in America, are designed with our software. So there is not much we could talk about. Uh, but those systems, many of them, are extremely sophisticated systems. Now we have decided, of course, with the incredible move from DARPA to be much more open, to do much more things around the world and publish those possibilities, including the Modelica language that some of you might have heard on many other things. So that move from systematic view of the world in 3D to a digital mock-up where we can replace the physical behavior of an entire airplane called the Boeing 777 that was done, remember, 21 years ago. 21 years ago. And still our company is doing physical mock-up to validate products. Uh, to PLM, which is not really the IT side of it, but the entire holistic approach on what we are doing with, with, with Jaguar Land Rover is the revolution of digital continuity across all stakeholders, including marketing and sales, because the value of the service is more important to now what we call the experience economy. So with those great clients, we have done a lot, whereas is a mean, not an end. And I would like to uh, just tell you that our motivation to leverage science, like Martin Kaplus results, what well, called the charm science link modeling, that we have already integrating in our bioscience platform, are creating a new dynamic to provide knowledge and capabilities to people who do not have access to that knowledge, but will use it in a very convenient way. And that's why we say the platform today, with the experience driving economy, is becoming a uh, uh, platform to really do social innovation that will serve the business and the society. There is a, a quick thing I want to show you because it, I think it, it, it gives you an idea about how even production systems are going to, are, are going to work, uh, if we can run the video. This is a project that we have with China. We decided in China to provide an extremely cool and extremely simple solution to do your uh, uh, flat or house layout. It's very simple. In fact, without marketing, we have multi-million users already. It's free for the time being, so go on App Store, own by me, take it, have fun with it. But that's not the point I want to make here. What we did from that is we discovered that consumers we're creating <clears throat> needs and possibilities that no provider in the world would, 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 would think about. Not only that, we now, in China, are building a platform where it's connected to the entire digital manufacturing system that produces those goods in such a way that we can real time do mass customization at the cost of mass production because the digital feed from the consumer is going to the laser cutting, to the production system, with digital continuity without human intervention. And that's going on why we started in China, because they love to take risk. Because they love to take risk. That's why we started there. And basically, it's, it's an amazing learning curve for us. If I move to the next one, this is uh, something where we see the evolution of production systems, which are going to be much more modular in the future. i show you a very quick illustration about human in the factory. The future of RAS is not to replace human. The future of RAS is to reposition human action within the production system in our mind. With uh, Airbus and with a few other advanced program, we have created an environment to really rethink about how airplanes are assembled. I'll give you an extreme consequence of it. Regina Dugan, former director of DARPA, one day called me and said, I want to visit the most advanced assembly line for airplane. This was five years ago, six years ago. So I invited her. And uh, when she came in the assembly line, she asked me, why is there no tooling? Where is the, where is the tooling? You, you, you remember the huge machine on tooling around planes in the past. 
we have now production systems where almost we are reaching zero tooling. The product is the tooling of itself. The product is the tooling of itself, which means Lego assembly, massive reduction of the cost, but not only that, then the robots becomes like people around the targeted object and will work in a smart way around the object itself. So that's the kind of revolution in production systems which is happening. So it was almost like a soccer field empty and the plane was going out being assembled with almost zero tooling. And can you imagine not only the dramatic reduction of OPEX, but also on CAPEX? So it, there is a lot of consequences, which means that things are not outside, they are inside. Uh, so that's an illustration. Another illustration is multimodal transportation in cities. We've been doing many projects for that. And I think I should I still have a few minutes, right? How many? Five? Two minutes? OK. So I'll show you uh, that last video to show you. I will not show you the Singapore video, but it gives you the same concept about how we can now apprehend what will be the future of smart cities creating a digital reference modeling and simulation. We are doing it with Singapore. Where, where, by the way, it's not about having the image in 3D on the navigation in the city. It's about understanding how waste management is done, how energy distribution is done, how people are living in the city, where are they going and how are they moving there, and what are the systems that should provide the right experience to the citizen. We recreated the city from satellite observations, from legacy integration of big data analytics on synthesis of those legacy data that they have, and we created then a new environment in which you can really simulate, in a few seconds you are going to see it, you can simulate <coughs> the service that are going to be provided to the citizen through an holistic collaborative approach where the multi-scale system is at the core of it. Because the problem with those kind of challenges is to be able to understand what is happening, connect disciplines together, and you will see here in a minute the flow of goods, flow of energy, flow of waste in the uh, including modular house construction. This is where in New York, Brooklyn, that we are doing that with, a, with a, a friendly company called Shop Construction, where basically they are doing in Brooklyn modular housing using extremely sophisticated smart systems to do it and, imp and evaluate the impact within the city. So the takeaway of what I wanted to share with you that I hope will be useful for your day is multi-scale multi system create uh, and remove the barrier of what has been the very point-oriented solutions in robotics up to now. Mechatronic software, electronic and hardware are becoming fundamental elements. Biomimicry is opening the world for completely different approach to innovation on the consumer, uh, the social innovation process, I think is shaking all businesses in the world. And I hope that with that, we'll be able to find out a new path for a more sustainable innovation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bernard, for a really inspirational uh, talk, a fantastic start. Uh, so we have some questions uh, through the medium of social Q&A. So I'm going to read these questions out, and uh, I'll ask Bernard to address them first. But I mean, feel free to, uh, uh, to speak to the questions, and of course, raise your hand if you want to add some questions. So the first one we have is um, 
It's a rather UK-centered question, but maybe an international perspective may be useful here. What skills do we need in the UK to make the best use of this uh, developing technology? So does France do this better? Do you, can you give us some advice <coughs> as how we should uh, skill well, ourselves? For I, this? Don't, I don't know if it's advice. I can give you what I have seen. Uh, uh, but I think uh, one thing that is going to change the entire world is the, ap the system approach. We absolutely underestimate the effect of having a system approach in all engineering disciplines. And system is not well taught in schools and engineering school. Uh, my, I've done a lot of research. I was professor before. And my professor was, was uh, former professor was used to tell me, if you ask a mechanical engineer to solve a mechanical problem, uh, to solve a problem, he will give you a mechanical solution. And if he has the same thing to an electrical engineer, he's going to give you an electrical answer. Yes. But that's not the innovation. So I think, in short, the system approach is going to change all discipline in engineering and even research. There is a video that I didn't show you, a system biology, for example, on the new research in biology and molecular <coughs> oncology we are, that we are doing right now is about multi-scale system. We launched a program with DARPA seven years ago. They funded us to create a curriculum in America. You can search it on the web. We create an entire curriculum. We deployed it in 200 universities in America for system design, system thinking, and what we call now experience thinking. So that's my input to you. Thank you. I mean, do feel free to, to come in with questions. We don't have to go through this in a particular order, but I'll just keep going uh, until you do. So the second question, and this is sort of an order of priority, um, Technology in the UK is far behind the US, Japan, and in Germany, both in mechanical and control engineering. How else can the UK contribute to growth? And how do we deal with the man-machine interface? Well, uh, as a side note, it's true that our world largest market share is in uh, Japan. Um, <clears throat> aside of this, for those reasons, uh, aside of this, I think uh, is a, you are asking questions which are UK-centric, so I need to yeah, tell you a little bit of uh, uh, inputs on that. I think there is a lot of in incredible IQ on, on knowledge in, in UK, mm. uh, on, on, uh, as, as there is in Europe, by the way, and also in France. So the, the question is how you translate uh, all this incredible knowledge which is available in science, in art, because I highly value the dimension of culture and art mm -hmm. also. I think it's, it's an inspiring domain for science. On the bio, biomimicry is another aspect. The question is to translate that in relevant value to the society. Well, I think we are facing a lot of challenges, whether it's city, health, it's natural resources, and I believe in Europe, not to be too specific about UK, mm. in Europe, I believe that there is a card to play. And the card to play is really to address those fundamental issues related to sustainable innovation. Because if we can connect fundamental research, technology uh, development, with this kind of um, needs, I believe we will create a good dynamic of growth on a relevant capacity to finance research. And that's why, you know, the kind of partnership we have uh, with the f famous right. companies in, is, is so essential also to feed uh, the research. I was yesterday doing, giving a lecture to Cambridge uh, Engineering uh, about construction. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you have to know that construction is 30 years behind other sectors. It's a disaster. It is a disaster. You know who are the first now in construction? China. I demonstrated yesterday that China Construction Group, state-owned company, state-owned company, would they do their IPO, they would be the largest engineering firm in the world day one. They do now buildings on infrastructure in cities like Airbus and Boeing is doing airplane or GLR doing their next generation mm -hmm. cars. So people have to open their eyes about what is happening. 
because it is happening and it's bigger than anyone expected. Okay, thank you. Does anybody want to ask any questions from the floor? Okay, so our th uh, this is the third question in our sort of list of priorities, somewhat related to, to the previous one, I think, is what are the most pressing challenges around translating these sort of innovative ideas and breakthroughs into, into, into technologies, into industry? Um, how can we really make that translation more effective and more rapid? What I've noticed, we have done a lot of experience in education uh, and with <coughs> young generation. That's why <coughs> I mentioned that many times. Mm. We did, we did uh, I'm going there, I just need to give you a little background. Yeah, we did a test in uh, uh, education for automated systems. Uh, you know, and there were a lot, a lot of curriculum mm. of, on the world. And we took, we took two classrooms, one with a fully equipped environment, highly sophisticated, and another classroom with only the virtual platform. And we made a test in terms of how new generation will learn quickly, highly sophisticated, you know, like what you are going to probably discuss today, uh, sophisticated uh, RAS uh, automatic systems, to see how fast they would learn and discover or by actually using the equipment, programming themselves, or using the virtual platform to do it. In all cases, they learn faster with the virtual experimentation. Mm. That's one takeaway. The second takeaway is we did open door with new generation, and they were using Lego robotics on a highly sophisticated system. On a, and then I went and saw a group of, in fact, five girls, 12 years old, doing an auto automatic, uh, autonomous car, little car. And I said, I asked them, I asked them, show me what you have been doing. And the car was there on the floor, running, going in the direction they wanted to. You know what they did? They said, come and see the screen. <laughs> yes. They did not ask me to go yeah. and see the car. They came and said, I'm going to show you under, you know, the way I'm having the thing on the tools. And they say, they say, look, I changed the law, and the car is moving in a different way. So that's a completely yes. new mindset. Yeah. And that's, I think, what we can play in order to accelerate that pull, because it provides an incredible power to connect people together without being together. Yes. That's an input. So here's one that's more about the sort of social impact of, 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 of this sector developing as rapidly as we anticipate and hope it does. How do we address the risk of the automation, as defined here, RAS effectively, um, has in terms of mass unemployment? How will it affect the employment structure? I guess this is the potential threat of, of job losses in certain sectors. It is. Uh, that's a very complex question. It of is. course, each of us can built a thought, uh, well thought arguments in either way. But, but I, I, I'll tell you what I think, what are my conviction. You know, I've been in this business for 30 years, so it's not the last five years. Yeah. Uh, we've working with the best in the world. Uh, <clears throat> I don't plan to retire soon. <laughs> uh, the passion for learning. But the point is, uh, I think if you look at the needs, aging population, if you look at the needs in the city, you, the needs in health, do we consider we have fulfilled the needs? Of course not. Look at even in mining, the needs for automation. Mining is in crisis now, and they are 30 years behind in terms of uh, really addressing the process of natural resources exploitation and optimization in a proper way. Mm -hmm. Sorry to be so uh, provocative. But that's the reality. So I think to address that question, my conviction is it's not about looking at the economy as it is. It's looking at the economy of tomorrow. And if I look at what is needed versus what we do, there is more of what we need than what we have ever done in the last two centuries. And that's a question of innovation and building up the new experience economy where we provide to aging population, education, health, new ways to elevate our quality of life, basically. So the race here 
is not really a race between co-robots and people. Mm -hmm. It's a race between the capacity of human being and business to invent new need to provide answers to, to needs with new solutions versus the replacement of what we do. And I believe that that's the trading we have to do. So it's more a social and business innovation than it is about replacing jobs, in my mind. <clears throat> Last time for any questions. We have one from the floor, yes, and then that's, we'll wrap up this Q&A. I'm going to ask about the disaster in Fukushima. You said Japan is in the forefront of <coughs> RAS, and yet the first people who got into to address the actual problem were human, human engineers, not robots. And they suffered disastrously. And it's not a new thing to happen to nuclear plants. We've had nuclear plant disasters from a long time ago. Could this not have been foreseen? We have got robotics in, in car um, engineering and other <coughs> areas. Yeah. And this is to prevent human uh, disasters to, to human beings. Yeah. Thank you for asking that question. And uh, I have uh, really some inputs for you here. Today, um, if I look at certain sectors of the industry, they are far behind what is done in the most advanced area. In the case of Fukushima, for example, you have to understand that people always assumed that if there was a problem, they could go and see. except there are certain conditions where you cannot go and see. You have to imagine, which is unbelievable, and by the way, which is the case for most of the big installations in the world yet, still, that there was no digital twin, there was no virtual twin definition of what was operated, whether we believe it or not. Do you think today people flying planes where they lose control because this plane is alone in the sky, do you think that in order to understand what is happening, they need to try to go in the plane to see what is happening? Of course not. We have the digital twin of what is flying. This is not the case yet in nuclear, and that's a big problem. Therefore, what the people have to do in case of risk, and man risk management, they have to go in stupid documents, drawings they don't understand. Nobody understands them. Believe me, nobody understands them. Who is this stupid guy that makes this 20 years ago? Oh, it's me. I don't even understand what I wrote there. So you have no clue of what is happening in the real world. This transformation is so needed. And you know who is the first to understand that? Russia and China now. And why did this happen? Because the people who have been engineering it thought that each time they were having a problem, they could go and visit the situation. And because they thought that digitalization was more expensive than using the traditional way. By the way, same disease in construction. So that's my takeaway. We did with Korea a simulation of what happened in Fukushima. We used the digital, Korea is very advanced, we do use the digital platform to evaluate the process that we should have followed in this case. And I can tell you, it's a reveal of massive information. They were not available. So that's my takeaway here. It's a very serious problem in many sectors, and I think uh, until those sectors understand that when there are risk, you should have the digital world to evaluate, to find out what you need to do in case of disaster recovery. Unless this is done, there's no many things that will, be, uh, will change. Well, that's an excellent note to thank. Thank you very much indeed for a wonderful talk.